Hi, it's Nicole. We are in Durham for the Durham Book Festival. between Edith Hall and Jennifer Saint. It's called The Power of the Classics. I got my little booklet here, <laughs> just to keep me right. It's mostly, yeah, so the professor, Professor Edith Hall was interviewing uh, Jennifer Saint. Some of you might know her better than I do. So Professor Edith Hall's interest, I guess, um, as he says here, the history, literature, and the philosophy of ancient Greece and Rome. She's really passionate about the classics. Um, at the end, there was a Q&A um, and a question from the audience is that, how do you, I guess, get children, get students in schools interested in reading classics? And more importantly, how do you persuade the people who's in charge of the curriculum? How do you persuade the school to keep classics in the curriculum? And um, it is whole. Her answer is basically she would personally come to your school and talk to the board and um, persuade them just by her sheer passion, I guess. That really um, impressed me. She's really passionate about it and I think she runs a campaign probably for years now just to get the classics into schools. Um, I don't know if she does lectures as well. I'd love to hear her lectures, just hear her talk about this kind of <laughs> topics overall. And Jennifer Saint, um, most of this talk, this interview, was about her books, her writing. She just published Atlanta, um, and she read the first bit of the book and the last bit of the book during the talk and gave a summary of what's in between. I find it quite funny. It's lovely. She basically gave everything out <laughs> what this book is about. Spoiler. <laughs> but I guess um, it's not it's not that a big issue with kind of ancient um, myth retelling. Everybody knows what the story, how the story goes. Um, it's her writing style, it's her spin on this story that's most important. I guess people read for that reason. Um, and she's a really lovely person. It's just quite interesting to hear her um, story, how she became interested in Greek and Roman, all these classic things right at the beginning when she was very young um, and how she kind of dropped sixth form did she say she changed her school altogether just so that she could study um, classics in school and then she went on to study university uh, on this subject and then she uh, was trained to be a English teacher um, and then kind of through that how she was not content I guess going back to the topic of the school um, I guess she had fewer and fewer opportunity to teach classics to her pupils and students so she found writing novel as a creative outlet to kind of express her passion in this area and that's how she became um, a novelist and wrote the three novels and she also told us that she's writing a new novel at the moment and it's from the um, perspective of Hera so she's writing this new novel about Hera and it's also very interesting she said the first three novels are all from a first-person perspective and this last one she's writing she tried to use first-person perspective at the beginning and she said she wrote 10,000 words or something like that and then she scrapped the whole thing because she said that just didn't work and that was not how 
Akira would speak or something like that. I find it fascinating. So she changed the novel to a third person perspective and carrying on with that. Um, so if you are a fan of Jennifer Saint, know that there's a new novel coming about Hira. And she said, um, yeah, and an audience member from the audience asked why did she decide to write a story um, about Hira. She said, um, yeah, Hira is portrayed as this terrible mother, terrible wife, um, always jealous. I read a little bit about Hira in uh, the Iliad. And she wants to tell her story from her perspective and just, I guess, show her in a slightly different light. I, all, I find that all very interesting. So maybe I will read some of her books. Uh, if you've read some of her books, let me know what you think. Um, and if you're interested in <laughs> a new book about Hera. Hello, we just came out of the Cousin Library. It's magnificent. I'll show you some footage in a bit. Just tell you a little bit about Durham. Durham is a World Heritage Site. So all of this is within the World Heritage Site. It's all old and fabulous. So this is Durham Cathedral. The oldest bit of Durham Cathedral was built in the 11th century, 11th, 12th century, so it's Norman. And then, so I'll tell you a bit about the library itself. We just went in. So the library is called Cousin Library because it was built by John Cousin. So the bit on my left um, is the oldest bit. So that was built in the 15th century. And then the library is kind of built next to it. Um, so John Cousin became the Bishop of uh, Durham in 1660. And then he decided to build this library and it was open to the public in 1669. So that's the first year we need to remember. Um, so it's mainly built to house the um, works of theology. So they are all in Latin, Greek, some in French and English as well. And I'll show you in a bit how they indexed the books inside is really cool. Um, so in 1832, the library was given to Durham University. Um, so this is part of the Durham, Durham University now. Um, so this library is the oldest, I think, <laughs> in the Northeast, the oldest public library in the Northeast. And Durham University is uh, the third oldest university in England. This is Bishop Cousins' library. Can you see the portraits on top of the bookcases? Those are the portraits of the authors and their books are laid underneath their portraits and that's their index system. There's a fascinating little story about the first folio. Um, Cousins' library owns... Oh, that's Henry VIII in the corner. I didn't know he wrote. Cousin's Library owns a copy of the first folio from the 17th century. It was stolen in 1990s. Apparently somebody came in and just lifted off the display and walked away with it. And years later, a good soul in America found it and said, oh, I think this is your copy. And then it was returned. It was unfortunately damaged quite badly. The front cover was torn off. So it's now securely stored away in a box. just had our breakfast yesterday after the little visit to the Cousin Library. We went to a water stone. There are two water stones in Durham. They are on the same street. One is a bit more academic, I think. There are a lot of Durham University hoodies in there, for example, a lot of academic things in there. And the other one looks a bit more like every other one has done so. And today, this morning, we have one event to go to. It's an interview, um, an interview with Helen Rebanks. She just published a new book called The Farmer's Wife. 
So she is the wife of James Ribanks, who wrote The Shepherd's Life, which is my favorite, well, one of my favorite non-fictional books. Um, and it's all about the Lake District, and that's my favorite place. <laughs> um, so I'm really looking forward to hear her side of the story. Um, so we're going in about um, 15 minutes. And then after that, there's another uh, event this evening um, at about 5 p.m. And I will tell you more about that a bit later. just came out of the interview with Helen Rebanks and I'm in front of the Durham Cathedral. It's a beautiful day. Um, so the book she wrote is called The Farmer's Wife and it's a memoir talking about her everyday, just day-to-day -day life on a farm in the Lake District. Um, and she said she started the book with recipes so originally she wanted to write some recipes down for her children i don't know if she was thinking about when they go to the university or something so she wanted to write some recipe down for them so the first one she wrote was marmalade um i find that quite interesting if 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 i was going to university for the first time I probably would want, I don't know, <laughs> um, spaghetti bolognese or uh, cottage pie or something. <laughs> I didn't think I would want a recipe for marmalade. I can just buy it in the, sh in the shop. But anyway, she clearly cares about it a lot, which is great. I loved it. Um, when she wrote it though, a lot of memory came back to her, how she learned to do it with her mother and the memory with her grandmother and just life in the farm all came back to her and the more she writes, um, the more it turned into, I guess, a personal story, uh, maybe how she grew up, I haven't read it, that's just the vibe I got from what she said. Um, so it turned into more of a personal history, personal story about her family, um, about the farm. Um, she comes from generations of farmers. Uh, so that's all like really interesting. And she also uh, is really passionate about wider issues as well. So it's not only about her personal life. Um, so she talked about um, food, in general, eating healthy food, um, how how we can make better choices when it comes to shopping food, cooking food, and just provide for our family and cook better meals. Something else wonderful, fascinating as well. Apparently her book, when her agent submitted it, I don't know what the process is, seven publishers wanted her book and they all kind of talk to her and want the deal want her to sign the book deal with them i think that's just amazing everything i i hear so far is you write a book you spend ages and ages find an agent nobody nobody replies you and it's hard it's really hard it takes years like months and years to find a publisher actually want to publish your book and the fact that she got seven publishers fighting for her book is just amazing and as she i think she went with a uh, favor in the end um that's just very interesting to hear as well so that book is out if you're interested um life of a um a farmer's wife um how yeah, I think what she loves most is still looking after her family and making, she, she uses home making, the word home making a lot um, to make the place, I guess, cozy and beautiful and nice, but also it's very much a real farm. So, so like <laughs> with mud and the children running around screaming. And one of the audience uh, member asked a question about what she thinks about cottage core. <laughs> on social media and she's like basically it's not for her it's a bit rom romanticized is that the right word um way of looking at farm life <laughs> living in a cottage that's just not real life according to her um so the the interviewer the host said maybe you can call it cottage hardcore <laughs> and that made us all laugh so yeah so it's it's real it's real farmer's life not 
idealistic imagined farmers farmers um, life so if you're interested in that I highly recommend Well, in the courtyard of the castle just came out of the little tour um, so this is the courtyard and we saw a Norman chapel original Norman chapel so this this whole castle was built in the 11th century I don't remember exactly the date um, as a military castle um, and about the same time as the library, if you remember, we went to yesterday about the same time, so 1836, I think that's what the tour guide said. It was given to the university as student accommodation. So we went to the Norman Chapel and then went up to Tungstow Gallery and then there was a beautiful, amazing Norman arch um, in that gallery and he said something about the Norman arches are usually on the outside of the old buildings and castles and cathedrals and things and because they are usually on the outside it get really badly damaged but this one because of the Tunstall gallery the gallery was built outside the original castle wall so it was built outside that arch so the arch was um, protected really well so it's still magnificent and then we went to the great hall where students today still have their meals breakfast lunch and dinner and formal occasions um, ceremonies and concerts and all sorts and then when we were, when we were in there students were <laughs> studying and doing their coursework and writing essays and things um, it's just quite amazing this this castle is still serving its original purpose well not original original purpose but it's still a student accommodation people still live here um, students still like sleep here and eat here yeah, it's just quite cool event at the Durbrook Festival, a dramatic reading of Cuddy by Toby Jones. We just came out of the dramatic live reading of Cuddy. It was excellent, I really loved it. Uh, better than I expected. I didn't know what to expect, so that's always a nice pleasant surprise. I'll tell you about the book first and then the performance. So Cuddy is about St. Cuthbert, who is the unofficial patron saint of the north of England. Um, so his name is Cuthbert. I think Cuddy is the nickname for St. Cuthbert. Um, what I'm not sure is if the author himself gave him this nickname or he has always been referred to as Cuddy, which is quite fun. You need to do some research. So the book is a kind of experiment, a mixture of poetry, prose, play and diary. And it's in four parts. 
so the first part is what we heard tonight so the first part is a group of monks carrying the body of Kadi. Um, Kadi has died by this point and they were carrying him around to find the final resting place for him to bury him and then I think the second third and fourth part is about different people who's related in this whole thing but throughout the history so part four for example is narrated by someone from 2019 I think um, and the whole book is about St Cuspus obviously and the city of Durham because St Cuspus was finally buried in Durham Cathedral so that's 1093 um, now that was when Durham Cathedral started to get built they they built Durham Cathedral in the honor of um, Cuddy so that's all quite cool so the whole book is about basically the city not just about this saint um, and the performance itself is so good so it's called a dramatic reading so I, I've never been to one before so I had no idea what to expect um, so it is a live reading so it's a performance um, so there were two readers two narrators so it was uh, Toby Jones you might know him I think you will recognize his face when you see his face if you search him on the internet he was in Sherlock he was in the painted veil he was in a lot of films and things and the other reader is Samantha Neal um, she's from the northeast of England as well um, so they did a really good job reading the reading the first part um, of the book I don't know if it's abridged um, like dramatized or is if that was the whole thing um, and so I expected the reading but I didn't know there was live music as well it was fantastic it was done by a group of musicians called the shining levels and they are local they are from Durham as well so they composed and performed the music specifically for this performance and this performance is on their website is called world exclusive for one performance only so they made all this music and performed it specifically just for tonight it was amazing it was lovely um, so we had a violin a flute the singer a guitar and a keyboard a um, piano um, and I just love the whole effect so they would read a little bit and then they would sing a little bit and then they would read a bit, read a bit more um, and then just the whole atmosphere it's it's really lovely and you hear the wind of Northumberland in the background um, that's just a lovely experience um, I, I'm sure they rec recorded it but I, I'm very glad I was there live um, I think that's the end of our little tour um, to Durham to Durham Book Festival I had a great time I hope you enjoyed seeing Durham and enjoyed hearing my events um, we are going to the train station and take the train home now I will see you in my next video